God bless you. God bless you. How are you doing? I'm doing something a little bit different um, right now. I'm doing this at a different time of day. I'm really doing it at night, and I normally do these things in the daytime. But this is just something that I feel is a little bit special. And it's just something that I really want to share. And it's really a, a message that I want to present. Now, I'll present it tomorrow. But the title is going to be The Power of Praise or Getting Victory Through Praise. How to get victory over our adversary, Satan, uh, through the weapon of praise, which God has given us. And one thing that I learned. Uh, when doing this and when praying and, and, and seeking God and uh, studying my word, I found out that praise, uh, praise is actually one of the highest forms of spiritual warfare. Praise is very effective when used in the right situation and praised is a type of warfare. Uh, when we look at it in the scriptures, we see it used during times of warfare to get victory over the enemy. And another thing that we're going to see once we get into this thing just a little bit is that our adversary, Satan, has absolutely no defense against the properly applied praise of a man or a woman of God. Satan has absolutely no defense over a properly uh, 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 praise when understood by the man or woman of God and when it's used in the proper context by the man or woman of God. Now, let me debunk something. And, and I've heard it said a lot of times in different fellowships, uh, when you want something from God, well, you got to praise God when you want something. Okay, this is true, but you know, it's we, we don't praise God in order to manipulate Him or attempting to manipulate Him into getting something out of Him, which is the attitude that a lot of people have. You praise God uh, when true praise that originates from the heart of the believer is true and genuine. It will move the hand of God in your life. Um, you know, hypocritical praise, I call it hypocritical, is attempting to use praise to get God to do something. And a lot of times it's something uh, that we want to ask amiss uh, so that we can use it for our own fleshly benefit. And, and God doesn't operate like that. That's not the way he works. But praise is a mighty weapon. And the enemy has no defense against a saint who uses praise the way that God intended. God gave us praise. And the enemy cannot have any weapon, any defense against the man or woman of God who uses praise um, in the correct way or who praises God with the right attitude, or should I say. I'm going to begin in Psalm 107, and we're going to set up a base there for everything else that I want to tell you. And we're going to use different scriptures, but I want you to understand that these scriptures will complement each other and, 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 and the different scriptures that I use will serve to enlighten you in the word of God. Okay, Psalm 107 verses 1 and 2 reads this. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of of the enemy. Now, you see that praise originates out of warfare. And also, uh, the foundation of all praise is giving thanks to God. Why? For his mercy endure forever. So it's talking about 
the redemption of his people. We praise God for his saving power, for his redeeming power, for his delivering us from the hands of the enemy. Verse 2 says, let the redeemed. Redeemed mean we were once not redeemed. We were once held captive, but now through the power of God, we praise him because we have been redeemed from death. Okay, he hath received, he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. So there's the warfare where he has, um, God has given us victory over the enemy. And it praises because of that victory. But it's also praise that brings us to victory, which we are going to see a little bit later on. All praise originates out of our experience with the power of God and God operating in our behalf, in our lives. All praise originates from God, from his operating in our life, in our behalf. Amen. For his redemption. We praise the Son of God because he brought forth grace and truth. Amen. And so we praise him for what he did, excuse me, in his redeeming work uh, when he redeemed us on, on the cross. So all praise, the purpose of all of our praise is to give thanks and glory to God for what he has done. Not to necessarily to get something from him. Now it is a warfare and uh, it is used in situations in the scriptures of warfare when you want the victory praise God but in those situations for praise to be effective it was praise that comes from the realization and the revelation of who God is and how great he is it's got to come from that realization you know the bottom line has got to be that revelation of who God is and how great he is Let's look at uh, verses 8 and 9 of Psalm 107. We're going to go down through there. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. So we see the purpose of praise. Amen. So see, we don't just start to praise God when we want something from God, as they tell you. We praise is a continual way of life. It's more than just jumping up and dancing, you know, more than just waving your hands. Waving your hands and dancing, that's part of it, but it is much more. It begins in the heart. It begins with the attitude of the saint. It's an attitude of thanksgiving. It's an attitude of gratefulness. Praise comes from an attitude of, of, of wonderment uh, at how wonderful at, that God is. Amen. It comes from that attitude, and it is something that dwells in the spirit of man. It's not just something you do just to get something. Praise may bubble over out of your spirit in many different manifestations, but the source of praise has got to be true. We praise God for who he is, and we praise him for his wonderful works. Now, let's go back. Let's go down a little bit farther. In Psalm 107, we're going to look at verses 17 through 21. And it reads, Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities are afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. Now it says fools now. Fools, because of their transgression, because of what they have attempted to do, uh, in their own flesh, their transgression got nothing to do with God. Now, the definition of a fool in the book of Proverbs is a person who says in his heart that there is no God. So the definition of a fool is a person who refuses to praise God. And because why? He does not recognize the power and authority of God. The fool relies on the power of what power or authority he thinks that he has in his own flesh. Uh, verse 18, their soul abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near to the gate of death. So this is the fulfillment of a fool not trusting God. This is the result. It brings forth death. Okay. 
Then, verse 19 says, Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. That crying out to the Lord is the beginning of praise. Because they realize that the situation that they are in, uh, uh, that their, their flesh will not deliver them. That fool has not realized that his flesh ain't going to get him out of it. He's been relying on his flesh. He's been saying in his heart that there is no God, that I, you know, I'm, I can and I will. And now when he gets in that situation, he sees that there is no way out according to his flesh. I'm going to give you a prime example, uh, the Apostle Peter. And we're going to talk about the Apostle Peter, uh, Peter a little bit later on. But we knew that Peter was an obnoxious man. Uh, Peter trusted in his own flesh. And during that time, it only brought trouble to him. His flesh brought him trouble. And, you know, uh, the enemy, uh, Jesus told him, he says, Satan desires to have you. And Satan desired to have Peter because he knew that Peter was vulnerable because Peter relied on his flesh. And we're going to talk about Peter a little bit later. Amen. And so Peter is a perfect example of what this verse is saying. But Peter yet had to come to the point where he realized uh, that his flesh was not it. He had to realize that it was Jesus um, who was the source of all good things. And when he realized it, and Jesus kept asking, well, you love me, Peter? Because Peter had bragged on how much he loved Jesus, so much more than everybody else. And Peter realized that he didn't have what he thought he did. And see, that's the same point that he came to when they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. That crying out is a, 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 the beginning of praise because they realize that in their distress, the only thing that's going to save them is God. It's not, going to, it's not that flesh which they relied on. They realize that the only thing that's going to save them is God. Okay. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men and let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. And that's the end result when God delivered them from their own destruction. Then they recognized God as their deliverer and then they began to praise him uh, uh, with a true praise which originates from the heart because they recognize now God is their deliverer and so you know sometimes it's good when we have situations uh, that are destructive or, 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 or that cause us uh, to suffer loss because in those situations maybe that's what it takes to cause us to understand that we need God in every situation and that he, his power is the only true source of, of deliverance and that we can't benefit uh, when it comes to the flesh. And now talking about the apostles, I talked about Peter. You know, Peter, um, um, he told Jesus in front of everybody how much he loved him more than the other disciples. And, you know, when he did this, they were in a, a, a place. He was there with all the other disciples. And he was telling Jesus in front of all of his disciples, though all of them, and he's probably pointing to them. They're probably sitting right there. And he's saying, oh, I, I won't betray you, Lord. You know, even if they all do. See, and so what he was saying is, they don't love you more than I do. I love you more than them. But the Apostle John, on the other hand, had the key because John knew that whatever he had to offer when compared to the love of Christ was absolutely nothing. He knew that there was nothing in him that would garner him victory 
uh, uh, over the things of the enemy. When John referred to himself, he referred to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved in most in, 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 in the Gospels, except in the book of Revelation when he had to refer to himself as John. But look at the difference. Peter referred to himself as the disciple that loves Jesus more than everybody else. And John, who lived in an attitude of praise, referred to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. So John is not focused on what is in his flesh. John's focus is on what's above. His focus is on what Jesus can do, on the love of God for him, and not the love that he thinks that he has for God. And a lot of times, you know, people will thump their chest and I've seen it and you've seen it. Oh, I love the Lord. And I'm not saying that you don't. But I would rather say the Lord loves me. You know, and, 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 and you know, somebody that might offend somebody. But let me ask you this. Have you ever, when the Lord woke you up at 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning and told you to get up and study your Bible or to get up and go pray? Has there ever been a time that you didn't do what he said do? That you didn't obey his word? Has there ever been a time, any time in your life that God spoke to you and told you to do something and you didn't do it? I know that has, everybody. Well, that shows that whatever you were doing, if you were sleeping, you loved that sleep more than you loved to do what God told you to do. Because if your love for God had been greater you would have overcome and got up and studied your word at 2.30 or prayed or whatever he wanted you to do. Amen. So, you know, let's not be quick to declare our righteousness and how much we have and what we can do for God because there's, there's, what we can do for God doesn't amount to anything or what we think we can do for God. But let's be like John and understand and realize God's love for us. John had an attitude of praise. Um, he always referred to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. And so when he did, he was praising God by recognizing the love of God for him rather than attempting to praise himself by exhorting his love for God. And so John had a different relationship with Jesus than the other disciples. John was the one that the Bible says uh, he would sit next to Jesus and lay, put his head on his bosom, on his, on his chest. Well, that shows a different relationship. When Jesus said, one of you is going to uh, betray me and all the other disciples wanted to know who it was, well, what did Peter do? He asked John, well, you ask him because he'll tell you. And that shows a different relationship, once again, uh, that John had. John was the one that followed. You know, in the end, John was following, and, and Peter wanted to know, well, what about him? You know, and Jesus told him, don't worry about him. It's not your business. You know, he told Peter, you follow me. But see, John was already following. John was the one who outran Peter. When they came to the tomb where Jesus was after they heard about his resurrection, John was the one who looked in the tomb. The Bible says uh, when he saw everything laid around and placed about in the tomb, it says John saw and understood. John was the one who saw Jesus, who recognized him after Jesus' resurrection when the disciples were out fishing and not anything and Jesus was standing on the bank John was the disciple that recognized who he was why because he had the right attitude he had an attitude of praise amen it wasn't about just shouting to get something from God but it was about continually being thankful continually uh, uh, giving God honor and glory because of who he is because you realize the person 
that has an attitude of praise is the person who realizes the power of God, but that same person also realizes their own uh, 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 weakness. And, and, and in order to praise God the way that we're supposed to, we've got to understand and realize his power. And we've also got to understand and realize our own weakness and our own ineffectiveness. Okay, let's go to 1 Thessalonians. I'm going to read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 19. It says, Rejoice forevermore without ceasing. That's that attitude of praise. That's that attitude that John had. He had an attitude without ceasing. He understood, amen, who the Lord was. He understood his position. And he never forgot. He never ceased to give God glory. Because he never, once again, uh, in, in the gospel, he never referred to himself as John. He wouldn't even use the, 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 a pronoun to refer to himself. He referred to himself as that disciple that Jesus loved. So John wasn't important to him. What was important to him was that disciple that Jesus loved. That's what made the difference to John. Okay. Um, this is the attitude that we should have. And this is the attitude that we have that will cause people to be converted to the kingdom of God. The name Judah you know, there was a tribe called Judah. The name Judah means praise. The name Judah means praise. Every time that they would go to war, every time that they would have to go out and defeat an enemy, and when they would seek God about what to do, when whatever uh, their leader would seek God, about what to do and, and, and you know he said well, sh well Lord shall I go up you know and the Lord would say yes go up and he would tell him he said send Judah first every time they went to battle Judah went first praise went first because it was Judah the praise that secures the battle and see they you know, uh, 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 many times they had to fight but the battle was already won but when you look at uh, Jericho, when Joshua took Jericho, all he had to do was march around the city. And Judah went first. Praise went first. And when they shouted with praise, the walls came down. Amen. And so all that they had to do was send Judah first. So whatever you're going through in life, when the enemy attacks you, send Judah First, send your praise out to meet him. Praise God. Uh, when he uses situations and circumstances against you that seem to be too heavy, and you know I can't handle it. You may not can't handle it, but Judah can. So send Judah. When you can't pay that bill, you can't pay the rent, amen, send Judah. When there's something going on, send Judah. Praise God. Okay. Um. When you can't fight the, 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 the politics that's happening on your job, the mess that's going on behind your back, praise God, and you're powerless to do anything. You know how you know how the enemy operates. Send Judah and let Judah do it for you. Praise God. Let Judah, let praise fight your battles. Amen. In spite of your opposition, you can look up and tell God, Lord, I thank you. Lord, you're wonderful. Lord, you are my God. Lord, above all things, it is you. You are the create. You are the creator. You are the maker. Amen. You are the power behind this universe. Lord, you are good. You are wonderful. My God, you are great. Send Judah out. Amen. Send Judah to go 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 fight your battle. Let's look at Genesis forty nine. I'm gonna read Genesis forty nine. Verses 8 through 10 for you. And this is what the Bible says about Judah, the tribe of Judah. This is the prophecy given. Uh, Genesis 49, 8 through 10. Judah, thou art he 
whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. So you see, Judah is a mighty warrior. God has prophesied victory, and so there's nothing that the enemy can do against Judah. Judah will win the battle. That's why he always went first. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Amen. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey, my son. Thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion. And as an old lion, who shall rouse him? Amen. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So whenever Satan attacks you, send Judah out to meet him. Whenever you attack Satan, send Judah out to attack. Amen. Judah is a warrior. We see him, how he's displayed as a warrior who is always victorious. And so we can always, once we send Judah, we can always give God praise for the victory. Amen. Let's look at Judges 7, uh, verses 16 through 21. Judges 7, verses 16 through 21. Now, in this particular passage of Scripture, we are talking about Gideon and his victory over the Midianites. And just to give you some background, uh, uh, the Midianites had oppressed Israel for quite a while. And it was time for God to end that oppression. And so Gideon was directed by God to gather an army to go fight the Midianites and deliver Israel from the oppression. Uh, Gideon gathered an army. God had to deal with him to get him to do it because he was fearful. And Gideon gathered an army, and at first he gathered about 10,000 men. And so what God told him, he said, that's too many for you to have, because if I let you go into battle with that number of men, and when we win, when we win, <laughs> you're going to think that you did it in your own power. He says, but I want you to know uh, that it is not through your power, but through my power that, that this battle will be won. And so he told him, you know, to send a bunch of men home. And he told him how to do it. And it ended up, uh, he ended up with 300 men. 300 men to fight thousands. Because, see, it didn't matter about the number. Amen. Because the battle was in God's hand. So it didn't matter about the number. But what I want you to see is we're going to look at this. And we're going to look at how uh, uh, Gideon fought that battle. Look at the tactics that he uses when he fights that battle. Okay. Uh, and he divided. Okay, now he's getting ready to fight the battle. He's got his 300 men with him. Each man has a lamp. Each man has a pitcher. Uh, a, a, a jug, a clay pitcher. An empty clay pitcher. In one hand, he's got a lamp in the other hand, a light. Okay, he's got the pitcher. It's covering up the lamp. So, you know, the dark, the light is being hid by the pictures. Okay. And he divided the 300 men into three companies. And he put a trumpet in every man's hand. So each man has got a trumpet. He's got a lamp and a picture covering up the lamp. A, a clay picture. You know, just a jug. That's hiding the light from that lamp. It's covering that lamp. The lamp is lit, but the picture is covering it up. Okay. And lamps are in the pictures. And he said unto them, look on me and do likewise. Now, this is all that they do. They're going out, 300 men, severely, totally outnumbered, going out to fight a battle. These are their weapons. <laughs> That's what they got to fight with. And so Gideon says, look on me <coughs> and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. And so now they're going to the Midianites camp and, and he's telling them they don't even know what they're going to do. He's just saying, just do what I do. What you see me do, that's what you do. 
Now that, you know, I mean, you're taking an army into battle and it's outnumbered. Praise God. And that's the only instructions you give them. You take them with a lamp, a pitcher, and a trumpet. And that's the only instructions you give them. You don't give them any tactical instructions. They don't, you don't have a plan of attack. Amen. But see, the battle is God's. It's in his hands. All Gideon has to do is to be obedient to what God told him. And all his men have to do is to be obedient to the way that God tells them to fight the battle. Amen. They just got to listen. And they've got to be obedient. Okay, this is which is why God chose them. Okay, um, he, he, okay, verse eighteen. When I blow with a trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp, and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. The sword of the Lord. You mention the Lord because God goes first into the battle. And of Gideon. You mention Gideon. Amen. Because God is using Gideon to get the victory on the earth. Even though Gideon really um, is not going to have to do anything so much in this battle. Okay. Let's go down to verse 19. So Gideon and the 300 men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch and they had but newly set the watch and they blew the trumpets and break the pictures that were in their hands what is the significance of this first of all they blew the trumpets the blowing of the trumpet symbolizes praise uh, when you see trumpets used on earth it's a symbol of men of God speaking the word of God on the earth. God may have spoken the word in heaven, but when the trumpet is blown, it's, it's, it's a man of God, a woman of God, speaking the word of God on the earth. And the trumpet uh, uh, is, is a trumpet of praise because it's the voice of God going forth to do whatever it is that God needs to do. Amen. And so the voice of God is going forth uh, uh, um, in the in the sense of the trumpets, and in the word going forth, the sword of the Lord, and of Gideon, and that's all it is. But then it says that they broke the pictures. Well, what's the sim uh, the symbology of breaking the pictures? Remember, inside each picture was a lamp, and that picture was covering that light. Inside. The saint of God is the spirit of God, which is covered by our flesh. Inside of our flesh resides the Holy Ghost. When that picture is broken, when the flesh is broken, when the flesh is moved out of the way, then praise God, the spirit of God can operate. Amen. All he needs us to do is to be broken. And to move the flesh out of the way so that the spirit of God can go forth and operate and bring us to victory. Amen. And so you notice they didn't have to fight. They didn't fight. All they did was sounded the trumpets, uh, 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 declared God, God's presence, pray, which is the spoken praise, gave him praise. They broke the pictures, removed the flesh, broke the flesh, got the flesh out of the way so that the power of God, amen, could fight for them. And when that happened, uh, the enemy got uh, confused. Let me read verse 20. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pictures and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow with. They cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood, every man in his place, round about the camp, and all the hosts ran and cried and fled. You see the power of praise in action. Gideon's men didn't even have to fight in this particular battle. That's all they had to do. Uh, when the ch children of Israel uh, took down Jericho, all they had to do was just praise God. 
The Bible said the walls fell down and the people were terrified. Amen. Satan isn't terrified of you. But he knows that there's nothing that he can do against the power of God. And so he will mess with you and play games with you. But he knows he can't play with God. Amen. Okay. Now. Okay. Let's look at Second Chronicles. We're going to look at another example of praise in action. The power of praise in action in battle. And in this particular case, though, uh, a prayer had to go forth. And this is going to be in Second Chronicles chapter 20 verses 5 through 12 and we're going to talk about King Jehoshaphat when he was surrounded and he was outnumbered um, when Israel was surrounded Israel was outnumbered and there was absolutely no way that they could win this battle it was not possible praise God so now you see he's in a situation well, he can either rely on his flesh or he can rely on God. If he relies on his flesh, he ain't going to make it. Amen. But the king knows this. So he's going to make his appeal to God. But he's going to have to do it in a prayer. We're going to talk about that, why he had to do it in a prayer. See, all Gideon had to do was declare. But this king is going to have to pray. We're going to talk about that. Okay. Verse 5, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Verses 5 through 12. Verse 5. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven and rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand thee? Amen. He's giving God the praise. He's not put himself in there nowhere. He's not bragging on, Lord, I got an army, you know, and we got so many horses and we outnumbered. And but Lord, you know, give us another. No. He's recognizing God as the source of all power. He's praising God because he's recognizing him as the source of victory, the source of power, the creator and the maker of all things. Okay. And then he says, is there, it, it, so that none is able to withstand thee? See, the king is he's a wise king because he understands that the battle is in the hand of God. And so he's turning this thing over to God. And he puts God in his proper perspective. He removes all confidence in the flesh and he knows that he's powerless. And so in the sense that he's doing this, he's also sounding the trumpet. Just like um, Gideon had to do. He's sounding the trumpet because he's applying the word of God. He's speaking the word of God on earth to that situation. Okay. Gideon was in that same situation. The difference, the reason Jehoshaphat had to pray is because God didn't give him a foreword that he would win. So he had to pray this way, amen, and speak to God and let God know. But see, with Gideon, God already had told Gideon he had the victory. All Gideon had to do was follow instructions because he knew there was no doubt in his mind. What Jehoshaphat had to do was to apply the word. And so, amen, if God doesn't give you a foreword, if he doesn't tell you uh, before the battle that you're going to win the battle, then he's told you in his word. And so you can speak the word of his word to that situation. Amen. You can speak to it from what God has told you. And if he hadn't given you anything before now, look in the word. Praise God. You can speak it according to the word and you can speak it according to the situation because Gideon knew that they were God's people and he knew that God would not let this enemy overcome his people. And there was no doubt in, in I'm not Gideon, Jehoshaphat, but there was no doubt in Jehoshaphat's mind that God should answer that prayer because a man, he was in agreement with God. Okay, let's look at verses 7 through 9. Art thou 
our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gavest it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend forever? Now he's telling God, wait a minute now. You gave us this land, and you said we were going to have it forever. And now these enemies are coming up against us. See, he's, 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 he's speaking God's purpose. And he knows God's purpose. Uh, so he can't speak it from God giving him a prophecy beforehand like he gave Gideon, but he can speak it according to what God has done and what he knows about God's purpose. And thou dwelt therein and have built thee a sanctuary wherein for thy name saying, look at the guy he's pouring it on, man. If when evil come upon us as the sword, judgment, a pestilence, a famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house. No, this is your house. Yeah, I live here, but this is your house. You put it here. You put your name. You put us here. And Lord, these folks coming against, you told us that it would be ours forever. See, he's totally removing himself from that situation. And <laughs> he's sending Judah in a sense. He's sending Judah out to meet that problem because he's giving God praise, amen, and declaring the glory and the wonder and the power of God, amen, to that situation before it happens. For thy name, your name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. He's telling God, you told us if we cried out to you, you were here, and I'm crying out to you right now. And that's the same situation when we saw in Psalm 107, except for the fact that in Psalm 107, the people were cried, that cried out. Uh, uh, they didn't particularly know God until they cried out. In his situation, he knows God. Amen. And he knows God's will. In their situation, they didn't. When we look at <coughs> the people of Israel, when they were in Egypt, before God rescued them, before he delivered them, um, the Bible says that they cried out because of their affliction. But the Bible didn't say they cried out to God. They didn't know God. They didn't know God until Moses and Aaron came and they declared who God was and God revealed himself through the miracles. So they didn't know God, but they were crying out. But God heard their cry. And he remembered the covenant that he made with Abraham. Amen. And because he said he would do it, and he brought it to pass. But before he could bring it to pass, they needed to cry out. And by crying out, they recognized that that affliction or the thing that was happening to them in Egypt, that situation was bigger than they were. Okay. So in, in, in this case, He's doing the same thing because the oppression is too much for him. In the case of Gideon, God took a whole bunch of his men away. He said, no, I can't let you have but a few because I don't want you to get it in your mind that you won this battle by your own power. Amen. So now the power of praise can go to work. Okay. Amen. So the king now he won that battle. God gave him the victory. Amen. But he had to sound that trumpet, that trumpet of praise. And he had to recognize and understand where he was in relationship to God. Same thing when we look like look to Peter and John. Uh, uh, Peter could not really get anywhere with Jesus until he recognized and understood and saw himself for what he really was. Okay, let's look at verses 10 through 12 and now behold the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt they turned from them and destroyed them not behold I say how they reward us to come cast us out of thy possession which thou hast given us to inherit look how he's pointing on he said Lord you gave us this land and you told us not to attack these people, and we obeyed your word, and we let them go. Look at what they're doing to you, Lord, after you don't did this here. See, he's not, he's not using himself. He's appealing to the power of God. He's throwing himself at the mercy of God, but he's standing on the word of God. Amen. Okay. Oh, our God, will thou not judge them? 
Lord, you're you going to let them do it? I know you're not going to let them do it. For we have no might. Ah, here it is right here. This is the key right here. For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Amen. Lord, if you don't do it, it ain't going to happen. Ain't no pride in there nowhere. Praise God. He recognizes it's got to be the power of God that saves me. It's not going to be pride. It's got to be a power of God. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Lord, we can't do nothing. We don't even know what to do, but we waiting on you. Whatever you say, amen. That's what we're going to go with because we don't have the power to stand against this enemy. Amen. This is what he prayed. He was hopelessly outnumbered. And in his situation, God moved and God delivered. And God gave him victory in the battle. Now, I told you that there's absolutely nothing, no defense. Satan has absolutely no defense against the saint of God who knows the power of praise. And we see how Jehoshaphat applied it in prayer. We see how Gideon applied it in battle. But in both cases, Satan had no defense. He has absolutely no defense. But now, let me tell you what he does. Uh, remember the story of Balaam. Okay, I'm not going to go on. But remember how Satan moved. Satan couldn't stop what God has blessed. He couldn't curse them. But what did he do? He taught them to commit iniquity and so that they curse themselves. Satan knows in your life when there are angels gathering to bless you, when God is getting ready to move in your behalf. The Bible says, I can't remember whether it's in Jeremiah or Isaiah, but one of the prophets said before, and it was the Lord prophesying, said before I formed thee in the womb, I ordained you a prophet. I knew you, and I ordained you to be a prophet. Now, I want you to understand, when God ordained you before you were born, the enemy knew it. God didn't do it in secret. Amen. He didn't have to do it in secret. It doesn't matter. He, he, the enemy, he's not afraid of what Satan can do. You know, he knows what he can do, and he declared it, and it was so. But have you ever noticed? Men and women of God, whom God uses, you notice that for some reason, it seems that they go through a whole bunch of extra stuff. And it seems like sometimes the people that God really uses are the worst, or the worst of sinners, was the worst sinner. Well, that's because Satan has tried everything he could. See, he can't stop what God is going to do. But what he can do, he can cause you to abort your own blessing. And so Satan puts weight on us. He puts us in situations. And he puts us in circumstances that are adverse, uh, that are troubling, that are tough. And the reason for doing this is to cause us to abort our praise. Uh, to abort, I'm sorry, our blessing. To Also to abort our praise. Because if he can make, he can get negative, if he can get you to speak negative to your situation instead of praising God, and if he can get your eyes off God, then he can get the victory over you. Remember how he did Job? What he told Job? Curse God and die. Amen. He knew that if he got Job's attention off God, and if he could kill Job's praise, then he had the victory. And so this is the way he operates against you and I. Amen. And so now you have it. This is the message that I, I really wanted to bring forth. The power of praise. The power of praise in your life. How God can use praise as a weapon and how the enemy cannot stand against it. I certainly hope you have enjoyed it. This is brother cedric rice new horizons in the word of god god bless you amen uh this is a message that i uh just just you know was working on and 
I plan on delivering this message. So I thought I'd do it tonight here and I will deliver it again. But nevertheless, I certainly hope it has been a blessing to your soul. God bless you richly and truly. Love you with the love of Jesus Christ. And as I always say, until the next time that you hear my voice, or until the next time that you see my face, I certainly hope and pray that those days, that every one of those days between now and then is the best day of your life. God bless you.